Good afternoon. This is Jim Soper with Ballots for Bernie. Uh, we are going to have an exciting live stream interviews, two of them today. Uh, the recount if came up as sort of surprise news to a lot of people, and we're going to be talking to two very knowledgeable people about that. For the first 20 minutes, it'll be Bev Harris of Black Box Voting, a long time uh, election integrity investigator and journalist, and all of us owe a, a great debt of gratitude to Beres, Bev for her her work in digging out how elections are really run. Later on, we'll talk with Karen McKim, uh, a leading democracy advocate from Wisconsin. She was. She ran for the county clerk office, registrar's office of Dane County, which is Madison. Didn't make it in, but she has been very active and will fill us in on what's going on in Wisconsin, the background, and what uh, what we might find in Wisconsin um, in, in the next couple of weeks. Very quickly, a little bit of background. I'm not in on the inner circle, but I'm on the peripheries and I've seen something. This recount was at least several weeks in the making. Uh, people talking to each other, leading election integrity advocates talking to each other in the background. And a lot of things had to fall into place. People are wondering, well, some people are wondering, well, was it all of a sudden? Well, it was not all of a sudden, but numerous things had to fall in place. They checked with Miss Clinton's campaign to see if she wanted to do anything, and the, the initial answer was no answer. So they went and talked to Jill Stein, and sh she needed some convincing. And I believe Bob Fertrakis did most of the convincing. He is a Green Party activist from Ohio, and he convinced her probably this weekend or Monday, Monday to, to go with it. And from then, they had a couple days to put websites and funding apps together. thing is that they collected two and a half million dollars for the recount in 12 hours. I've never seen that before. I expect it's happened on Facebook before, but uh, this was amazing. And so now it's just a few days later and we're going to have a recount in Wisconsin. They're probably going to file for recounts on Monday and Wednesday in Michigan or Pennsylvania or the reverse order. I'm not sure which and target those three states. We'll try to address some of the questions about that and some of the planning for that a little bit later. But this represents a huge opportunity for us to look at ballots and beyond that, the people leading this are heavily involved. Bob Petrakis, John Brakey, Jonathan Simon, they're all longtime election integrity advocates. And they're a look, they want to do uh, as much as they can a real audit, which means going beyond the ballots and looking at logs and voter rolls and things like that and looking all over the place and seeing what they can dig up. But let's first go to Bev. Hi, Bev. Hi there. Um, you're a little soft here. How are you doing? All right. There you go. Doing okay. Can you hear me all right? There you go. Now we have you loud and clear. <laughs> okay. What's your reaction to the recount, first of all, and, and then maybe words of advice on how to conduct a recount? Well, you know, it's exciting that we see this happening. Um, I'm a little nervous about it uh, for this reason. It's It's kind of been... Uh, put in the context on the network, uh, on TV news, as being a way to check whether the voting machines were hacked, with the implication being it might be Russian hacking and so forth. Um, I think that that can get a false positive or create a false sense of confidence, because if the voting machines are manipulated, they're likely to be manipulated by insiders or, or local fixers or jobbers, not somebody in Russia. But the implications of that is that there's also likely to be a cover-up. Uh, and so the, the people who are observing the election, and the, there's some great people out there, they know this very well. 
um, they need to not only observe the counting of the ballots, but they need to be looking for evidence of a cover-up. Because if it's local or insiders, they're not just going to hand over ballots that don't match the computer account. They're going to try and make sure that those are reconciled ahead of time which uh, is a separate set of things to look for. Now, the good news is that a lot of the activists involved in this are very familiar with this kind of thing and uh, are well aware of the things they need to look at. Okay. Can you think of all right, a little bit more detail, and especially of some interest to Pennsylvania, which has oh, uh, yes. a lot of just DREs with no paper, how can people... Yeah, I don't really know um, what they mean by doing a recount of Pennsylvania because it's not really recountable. Uh, what they're talking about uh, is a retabulation, which is uh, basically just saying, we're, it's kind of the equivalent of going to your bank and saying, will you print me another copy of my bank statement so I can check if it matches what I already have online? I mean, it, of course it's going to match. Um, so the Pennsylvania stuff is going to be... Um, really really interesting to see what they figure out they can do in order to check this now there is one interesting thing the paperless dre machines for the most part do create uh, individual ballot images and if they were able to look at those it could be helpful in certain ways well given that john brakey's in on this i think they're going to be digging for those images oh yeah uh, <laughs> oh yeah john brakey is sort of the king of ballot images so, and he knows that those DREs have them. I, I, I've got copies of them. I mean, it's, it's really rather impressive. The caveat with the ballot images is that if they rig an election on a touchscreen voting machine and they use the precinct voting machines themselves, the ballot images are going to also be tampered with. But if they use the central tabulator, to tamper the the ballot images are pretty impervious to that and actually will not match so uh, you know so that's they're a good diagnostic for central tabulator tab tampering such as what well you know one of the uh, series that we put out was a series called fraction magic which shows how uh very very quickly and precisely the results on a central tabulator system can be completely altered in every precinct in very precise ways that mimic demographics but we did test that with a dre system central tabulator uh and we found that when we did now no i understand that nobody receives these ballot images nobody knew they existed until recently and nobody asks has asked for them but when we look to see what happened when we executed this fraction magic program and changed all the results the ballot images actually retain remained intact so uh, they they require a different it's not that they could not possibly be tampered with but they require a, a different method and a considerably more sophisticated method and it has to be done as a two-step process not a one-step process the the hacking with fraction magic has to be two right okay. well the ballot images themselves oh, um yeah okay yeah they don't quite know what to do with themselves if, for example if you say i just want this guy to i'm just going to change this guy's votes from 100 to 50 uh and i'm going to change the other guy and add 50 to his the the ballot images are each an individual image and they don't quite know which ballots they're supposed to change those votes on i mean it's not automatic right yeah. so uh you have to do a separate process and it's they're also in the central tabulation system they're one of the few database portions that are encrypted so uh it's not like you can just go in there like you can with the vote totals and just edit them you have to actually know what you're doing um the images themselves are encrypted. Well, you can you can view the images, but they also exist in the central tabulator as a data table. So, so somebody who had the encryption key could also uh, execute an exploit on those. Uh, but you have to have you know it's it's like not the not the low hanging fruit. It's the higher hanging fruit. Okay. Uh, it, I've done some, I'm a programmer, I've done some looking at some of the image files, at least especially for PNG, and it is heavily encrypted, which would be encouraging. I'm not sure what they're using on these machines, uh, but we'll look into that later. If they're there, sure. this is this is huge progress from 10 years ago. 
to, to, to have them there. And we need people across the country to insist that counties acquire or you, if they have the capability of retaining pictures, digital images of the ballots, that they do so and ultimately make those images public. And then right. also, also verify that the images that they make public are images of the actual ballots, which is still another step in the audit. Mm -hmm. But uh, exactly. um, this would be a huge, huge step forward. Um, yeah, I'm, I think it's one of the most optimistic things we've seen in 10 years, where there actually are some relatively simple things which are fairly available already, which don't cost a lot of new money, yeah. that can be done to really solve this issue of whether the voting machines are uh, able to be authenticated by the public. Now, um, in Wisconsin and Michigan, of course, they do use paper ballots and, and occasionally in some of the counties in Wisconsin, a, a verified paper trail. But they have paper. Um, a lot of people are under the misunderstanding that, well, they have paper, so the machines could not be rigged. I've, I've read that comment quite a bit. Uh, that actually has nothing to do with it. Usually paper ballots are never looked at. And in some states, they cannot be looked at, even in a recount. In Wisconsin and Michigan, they can be looked at. Um, but they, uh, it still is going to require some vigilance. And I have an article up on blackboxvoting.org right now called When is a Recount a Sham? And that addresses the issue of how, if you have a paper ballot recount, uh, but you have tampered with the machines, how you go about reconciling it so that people who are observing the recount won't know that it was tampered and that everything will match up. Uh, we have seen recounts like that. Um, but uh, if, if observers know what to look for, uh, they're going to, to quite likely spot some of the symptoms of a cover-up. I will ask the question. There's hopefully, we're going to have hundreds or thousands of people going out to Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania to watch these recounts. Mm -hmm. uh, you, should sign exactly. up, you should sign up at uh, Jill Stein's webpage to, to volunteer. And I don't, we'll, we'll get that web page up to you in, in, in a bit, but you should sign up to volunteer. For a citizen observer, and they're going to go out to a county headquarters, what are the most important things they should be looking for? Well, you know, and, and let me preface this by uh, it's important not to disrupt the process and to be polite and soft spoken. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, if you, you don't want to give a reason for people to say that it's annoying to have observers there. Um, but some of the things that to look for uh, before the recount ever starts, if there has been machine tampering, there will be attempts to get at the ballot uh, several days before the recount in some cases. And one of the symptoms of that will be if you just drive by the place where they have the custody of the ballots, which may be the county election office. It can sometimes also be a, a, an elections warehouse, which is uh, out in the boonies somewhere. Uh, but if you just drive by uh, on weekends and off hours and, you know, in the middle of the night when nobody should be there and you see a bunch of cars in the parking lot and lights on inside, uh, that's concern. Uh, you know, take a video camera and capture who that is, get some license plates. Um, because they will do that if they need to get those ballots adjusted so that they match the machine count. Um, so that's one thing that can be done beforehand. During the recount, one thing that has been spotted in uh, <laughs> dodgy recounts, uh, this was spotted actually I think by Bob Petrakis in Ohio. There were, they were posting the desired results on the wall so that the recounters would know ahead of time what they were supposed to come up with. Um, you shouldn't be seeing things posted on the wall or written on people's arms or people pulling slips of paper out of their pocket. Uh, they should be recounting with, you know, granted that the results have been published, but they shouldn't have that in front of them so they know what the answer is supposed to be before they get it. Uh, I think you, that's all very helpful. I think an important point there is the results should be published already and people should have that before the recount starts. Uh, right, right. But it that. shouldn't be um, because they recount by precinct. So uh, it would take, uh, you know, Rain Man to remember every single precinct and what the total should be for every candidate. So you don't want to have little cheats, cheat sheets floating around within the recount itself. Um, so that's another thing. And and also another area that's uh, quite commonly 
problematic is the sealing uh, and the chain of custody of the ballot boxes. These ballot boxes, when they are brought in for recount, should be looked at fairly carefully, and they should be sealed with real seals, and um, the ballot should be in the box for the correct thing. Uh, some of the kinds of things that we've seen, uh, for example, in one recount we saw in, in New Hampshire, the sealed ballot box for Manchester Ward 5 had the word six ballots in it and vice versa, which was impossible unless someone had gotten at the ballots in between the ceiling and uh, whatever. Uh, so, and, and in Detroit, a recount was found where a, a large number of boxes of absentee ballots were brought in, and they were sealed nicely on the top, but they were openable on the bottom and not sealed there. So these kinds of things. Okay. Um, they were possible. I think they should be filming everything. Absolutely. The film, uh, it's best to take a video camera with a zoom lens and good audio. Uh, a well done, a properly done recount, the counters actually call out loud each one. The best way they do it would be just called sort and stack, where they, they uh, call out, for example, they'll have a mixed set of ballots and they'll say, you know, Stein, and then they'll say Clinton, and they'll put each one in their own pile. So Clinton will have a pile, Stein will have a pile, and so forth. And they call that out out loud. And ideally, it should be situated so that the people observing the count can see the, uh, especially with a zoom lens, can see the marks on the ballot and see that they're calling out the, you know, the correct thing, uh, which is not difficult to do. And, and properly done recounts do that. But um, occasionally you see a recount where they put everybody, you know, a football field away where you can't see anything and tell you that you're observing the process when all you're really observing is people walking around a room. I was going to say bring binoculars, but you may need an astronomy telescope for some of these. <laughs> if you're in San Diego, bring the astronomy telescope. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. What about the, you talked about ballots and watching those, but this recount is going to, I mean, Bob Fertrakis on Friday night in the call said they're going to go after the logs and voter rolls and so on. What can yeah. you say about checking those and, and, and making sure that they work out all right or not all right? Uh, that's a good point, especially in Wisconsin, where they have same-day voter registration. Um, now, I've done, I've, I've monitored a recount with same-day registration. And um, one of the things you always want to do in any recount is look at the list of signatures in the poll book and make sure you have the right number of signatures comparing up with the number of ballots. You shouldn't have... For example, several hundred more ballots than you have signatures. That's a problem. Um, in same-day registration states, there can be some real problems with accounting for those same-day registrations sometimes. And we spotted this in a New Hampshire recount. They just, the poll worker, no one signed it that were same-day. The poll worker just added a whole list of names at the end. You know, John Smith, Mary Parker, blah, 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 and with no addresses or anything. And so, yes, the names, number of names added up with the number of ballots. Battery low. <laughs> yeah, so you just end up with this large number of list of names that you can't really account for. That, but so one of the things to look for in Wisconsin is going to be um, not just at polis, but are they accounting for their same day registration? Okay. Um, well, uh... Do you have anything else you want you want to add here to for especially for the observers, but then for the general public? Well, I think that it's really a, a good exercise to do. Now, we should remember that um, if the ballots do match up, that doesn't prove that nothing was done with the machines because it's really difficult in most cases to really adequately monitor this. But it's really important that as many people get out there as they can, and that uh, that. People understand that when you are observing, um, your job is to be quite vigilant and quite observant, you know, <laughs> observer, uh, and not just believe everything you're told and not just assume everything's right, because sometimes it, you know, a lot of times it is right, but sometimes it's not. And it's your job to be able to identify and flag um, situations that are anomalous, even if you can't resolve them. It's very frustrating sometimes when you know you can't resolve them. Uh, because they're not going to cooperate with you for whatever reason. But you still need to document it. And uh, you can still remain polite and, and not disruptive, but yeah. you can also be at the same time assertive about pointing out what's wrong. 
Yeah. We're going to pass the mic over to Edie Overa here, who has a couple questions for you. Hi there, Bev. I have, Hi. I'm seeing two questions here on the live stream. David Smith has a comment, wants comments, your opinion on the open letter to Jill Stein written by Richard Charnin, uh, I think on the 27th, which is today. I don't know. If I haven't heard. read that letter, so okay. I probably can't intelligently comment. Okay. The other one was, do you know where citizenship, citizens oversight um, is involved in this project? That's Ray Lutz's group. Right. Oh, um, I, I don't. And um, I, I mean, I've been back and forth with um, and, and in touch with Ray Lutz. I think he's done great work. But as, as far as I understand, he's been down in Florida doing some excellent work down there. He produced a film. Sure what his, uh, although I, I know that the uh, people who are organizing the recount, Bob Petrix and the four, those folks are, are much more likely to know that kind of detail. Uh, Ray has been doing fabulous work and he did a, a, a very interesting video of a random selection for audits that he's posted. Go to citizensoversight.org or look him up on Facebook and places such as the uh, black box voting Facebook page or Occupy rigged elections. And scroll down, you'll see some videos. A video he did from Florida that was eye-opening. Uh, oh, Palm Beach County. Yes, <laughs> yeah, to say the least. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they they don't do random selection this time around, but still, it sort of opened some eyes about what some bad apples can do to ruin the whole thing, which is leads us to why we have to have recounts. Um, right, right. This is such a valid thing that's being done, but we have to remember that um, this has not been done very often, and so uh, we're probably going to spot a lot of things that will be troubling and need to be addressed uh, after the recount if we can't address them during. Yeah. Uh, I, I will stay, and then we're going to switch over to Karen. Um, Karen McKim from Wisconsin. But I'll say here, again, this is going to be messy. And <laughs> Thank you. Yes. This is going to be messy because <laughs> it's just, it's, it's being put together quickly, which is part of how these things happen. And you have a very good team leading this. These are people who are real patriots, they're intelligent, and they've been at this for 10 years. I'm seeing a lot of second guessing out there. Well, why aren't they recounting Florida or North Carolina, this, that, and the other thing? Have some faith that they're doing the right thing and try to give them some space because I'm sure right now they are very, very busy. Right. Thank Right. But, you know, and I'm so glad you have Karen to come on. I mean, uh, she is just a, another of the treasures that is out there helping uh, really make things better than they have been. Yes. Yes. There's one more question that one more question uh, from... Tina Rocket mm -hmm. is asking is if either of you are familiar with Greg Pilas' last interview on CNN where he said, forget the hacking, it doesn't flip elections. Do you guys know? Oh, he doesn't know. Uh, he, he doesn't know, but he has done some fantastic work in the area of, of voter lists. Um, one of the things that's helpful to understand is that there's four different areas where elections can be tampered with, and they're, they're, uh, they, one doesn't necessarily rule out another. Uh, those four areas are the, who can vote, which is the voter list, who did vote, which is that poll list, the participating list, the, the counting the of signatures. the vote, yeah. and then the chain of custody. What, cha what Greg works on is the voter list, the who can vote and who did vote area, which is very, very important. But that is kind of a separate issue than did the machines count correctly. People should see his film, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy for the revelations on how many millions of votes were being suppressed through automated lists across states. It, it was called the Interstate Cross Check. They should see his yes. film there. Uh, people like Bev Harris or more are experts on the actual vote counting. And so we thank you, Bev. I'll well, thank you very much. And you guys, uh, great job. 
keep up the good work, and uh, I'm sure Jim, you and I will be, and Karen will be in touch yeah. uh, as we things go forward. Okay, I'm going to put you on mute if you want to stay on and, and listen. That's fine, uh, but we're going to switch over to to Karen. Great, I got to jump off and and uh, wishing you all. Thank you. Bye Thank bye. you. One moment, folks. <laughs> okay. Uh, Karen, you'll have to unmute us. Karen? We're trying to connect through Skype here. Karen? Mm, her line might be a little frozen, which is okay. Okay. We'll hang up and call her again. You give me the phone and I'll make some comments and try to answer some questions they're working with the, the computer. It should be facing you. I'm sorry? It's facing you. So that you can yeah, yeah, I'm up. seeing me. Um, okay, a couple things. We're going to talk, there are, there are paper ballots in Wisconsin, Michigan. The issue of Pennsylvania, if you go to verified voting and look at the top at something called the verified, you will see a map of voting systems. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Uh, we're getting, uh, yes. we're hearing Karen. Um, if you go look at the map of voting systems for Pennsylvania, you'll see that that indicates that Pennsylvania is a, a mix of paper ballots and machines with no paper. And the machines with no paper, the voting machines in Pennsylvania with no paper tend to be in the rural areas. I've seen some people saying that the law was changed, that there are no paper ballots in Pennsylvania, but nobody cited any sections of elections code. So I'm not sure the information that we have from verifiedvoting.org, their verifier map indicates that there are indeed uh, paper ballots there. And the point of this recount is not so much to change the result of the election, although that could be a benefit, a side effect. It's to actually and count the votes, or count the ballots, and double check the system across three states. And I think we're likely to see that there are some anomalies out there. And this will help the entire election integrity movement move forward and say, no, we cannot trust the system. It is not secure. It is, it can be hacked. It can be, people can, can fiddle with it in various ways. And that's part of the, a big reason, or the main reason for this recount is not to get a person A or B elected, is to check that the vote was right. We're going to switch over to Karen McKinn. Hi, Karen. Hi. Um, can we hear each other? We can hear you. We can see you. Yeah. First of all, Karen, would you give us a little bit of your background about what you've been doing in Wisconsin for election integrity? Um, I got involved with election integrity, I don't know, maybe about four years ago. Um, and I'm coordinator of something called the Wisconsin Election Integrity Action Team. We're in, we try to be involved in many different uh, aspects of just making sure our elections reflect the true will of the people. But the main thing we've been pushing for for the past four years has been um, routine, valid, transparent, rigorous post-election audits. Uh, basically, if we did those routinely, we wouldn't have recounts. And uh, we would have verified accurate results after every election. Um, and we've developed a, an audit procedure that could easily be used in Wisconsin's county canvases before results are certified using the digital images uh, and something called risk limiting auditing, which is uh, endorsed by American Statistical Association, Phil Stark out of Berkeley. Um, but we haven't been able to interest any county clerks in doing it. So this past election, just on November, I was on the ballot as county clerk running on a platform of we need to have verified accurate election results. I didn't win, but we got a lot of good publicity and a lot of good talking and really raised the awareness of the issue, at least in Dane County. And then the recount came up. <laughs> and that's going to raise awareness even more. Can you, oh, yes. <laughs> can you give us a little bit of the history ever since Scott Walker became governor 
of what went on with elections and an election integrity point of view in Wisconsin uh, in, in, the, in the recent past, the past few years. And, and do it in two seconds. I... <laughs> <laughs> and two words, a disaster. I, you, know, um, you know, messing with voter ID, messing with registration. You know, we used to be able to have citizens running around registering each other to vote, you know, special registration deputies, they were abolished, uh, had voter ID, they tried to mess with polling place times and locations. Uh, they've tried to mess with every way they could. I mean, Wisconsin legislature is extreme radical Republicans, and they have control of all three branches of government, and there is just no limit on what they will do to control the outcomes of elections. Fortunately, Knockwood, whisper, don't let them hear. They haven't messed with the county clerk's ability to count votes accurately yet. Um, but well, that's one of the reasons we haven't run to them to ask for changes to require post-election audits, because we don't want them messing with that part of the statute. County clerks could do it now in Wisconsin if they wanted to. But yeah, it's been bad, really bad. What about uh, Waukesha County? Uh, there was some smoke coming out of there. Do you care to talk about that or should we just move on? Uh, Waukesha County wasn't a problem with the machines, uh, but it was a problem with the ballots afterwards and the county clerk certification and handling of the record, a lot of the ballot problems that um, Bev was just talking about. Uh, that county clerk ended up costing Waukesha County hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees and she was essentially fired. Um, she's not there anymore. Um, but as county clerk, she's still in the area. Um, but um, yeah, it, and there was a recount and that was botched because of poor record keeping. That's one thing I, I also agree with, with Bev, the recount is going to reveal to us a lot of systemic weaknesses and failure to follow regulations and whatnot with ballot records, with election records. Um, that we won't do any able to do anything about, but the recount, if we have good enough observers in every place, will make us be able to document and raise awareness of the need for much better election administration. Okay. Um, what do you expect for to, to come out of this? Some of the anomalies you might see. What what what, do you, what, what should be what should observers be looking for? Um, well, just there's a nice package of everything that the recount will is required to do online. Uh, just Google Wisconsin recount manual, and it's really a pretty good manual. Uh, it's on the Wisconsin Election Commission website that uh, covers in very easy to understand terms all the requirements that the county clerks, and it is the county clerks that are doing the recount. Um, should be following to do the recount. And anyone who wants to take a look at that manual um, will know the things you should be looking for, the things that we'll be able to enforce if they don't follow them. How can they um, find the manual? Things like every observer must be able to uh, see every ballot, and that's in there. So, Do, do they have a yeah. definition of see? I mean, do you need a telescope to see the ballots? or I can't hear you right now. Um, um, no, uh, well, it depends. Every county clerk is going to do it differently, and that is going to be the big point of contention. There's going to be observers from the Clinton campaign and the Trump campaign and the Stein campaign, uh, and they're all going to be jostling for position to see the ballots. I've actually recommended to the Wisconsin Election Commission and, and got an, uh, a, what's the word, um, conditionally favorable response that I, I recommended they use document projectors, you know, as they're counting the ballots, just put have project them up on the wall so that everyone in the room can see them. Um, we'll see if any of the clerks do that. Um, that would be an obvious yeah. solution. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes obvious solutions get done. Um, but I know the clerks don't like all that breathing down their neck because, again, the, the rules that you can download say they have to let every observer see every ballot and have to rig up some way to make it happen. What do you understand about the roles of the various players here? Because we have um, 
Jill Stein is the principal person contesting. And now Hillary Clinton's campaign is, is doing some kind of observer role. And then there's a gentleman named Rocky something. De La Fuente. De La Fuente. Uh, who is he and what impact could he have on this? He was another third party um, presidential candidate on the ballot. And I wish I hadn't paid attention ahead of time because it turned, I looked him up afterwards. It turns out he ran on a campaign of election reform. Um, wow. He's a good guy. <laughs> um, his motives are, are right. Um, yeah, you go to the election commission and, and uh, download his petition for a recount. It says all the right things. It's, it's really good. Um, but he doesn't have people on the ground. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Uh, let me see. The rules for a recount are that any candidate on the ballot can have an official observer at any in any county for their recount. And so, yeah, there will be Clinton observers there and Trump observers there and, you know, everyone will be there. They all have standing because they were all on the ballot. Um, Does being on the ballot but, give you extra standing to observe or can any citizen just go in and watch? Any citizen can go in and watch, but if you're there as a representative of one of the campaigns, you will get special, you know, if there's too many people in the room, um, they can give preference to the official representatives of the campaign. So if you're saying, if you're there saying the Stein campaign sent me, they can't throw you out. Well, they can throw you out of the room if you're disruptive, but you have to be able to say, I want to see that ballot. Uh, on the other hand, if you're just a citizen observer that shows up without any campaign behind you, they probably won't make make special accommodations for you to be sure you see every ballot, something like that. But all the, all the candidates have the same; their representatives have the same standing in the county in the county recounts. So people should um, sign up with the Stein campaign. Do you have hand know the the address for that? Oh, um, if not, we will get it posted on www.stein2016/wisconsin-recounters. Um, yeah, um, we'll post, yeah, we'll post it, it on the Facebook and, page, or, or uh, yeah. and, and get it up there. But they should be signing up to volunteer with the Stein campaign. Uh, yes, they have a page for that, and they list how many counties are in Wisconsin now. 72. And if you go to the Stein campaign to sign up for Wisconsin, they ask you which county you'll observe in. I, my understanding is they have plenty of volunteers in Dane, Milwaukee, and Waukesha. And sign up for any other county than that, I think, would be most helpful. Uh, some of the other, it, It's going to be harder to get observers in some of the other, what, 68, 69 counties. Well, first of all, you have more counties than California does. But... Uh... Yeah, I, I think a lot of the rural counties are important and they're not expecting people to show up. And so the surprise factor would be a plus. There were, there were four. Well, not even just the rural counties. Counties like Fond du Lac or, or Brown County, which is Green Bay, or uh, Marathon County, which is Wausau, La Crosse County, Eau Claire. Yeah, uh, there's, it, it doesn't have to be rural, but... Um, yeah, I, th I just think there's plenty of observers from Madison, Milwaukee, and Waukesha. Okay, so go to go to the other counties you just named, Green Bay, Wausau, um, Fond du Lac, and so on. And, and I think you'll have a good time there, too. It, side question, are, are the trees yeah. still in, in bright colors, or are we past that? Um, I'm, your audio is breaking up for me. Say it again. Are the trees in bright colors, or are we past that? Oh, past that. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, okay. You mentioned a document listing the the observer procedures. Where be, can people find that? Um, oh. The URL for that's very complicated. Google Wisconsin Recount Manual. And when I Google Wisconsin Recount Manual, it pops up first. It's on the Wisconsin Election Commission website. Well, I'm sure you've Googled that a hundred times, so you might be <laughs> listed <laughs> ahead of time. There were, I've seen mention of four counties as being leading suspects in this. Can you say anything about that? I think Racine was in there. You're breaking, 
Right. You're breaking up again. Um, can you hear me? Oh yeah, you I should hear me. I can hear you, but I, I, I've I've seen a list of some list of four counties that were particularly suspect. Do you know what I'm talking about? Racine was among them. I, oh, I've seen different people do different analyses that showed different anomalies. My personal opinion, I don't think any one county is any more suspect than any other, but um, I think the CVS analyses, the um, uh, cumulative vote share analyses, showed that the city of Racine, maybe not the whole county, and perhaps the city of um, Milwaukee, again, maybe not the whole county, showed suspicious slopes on a CVS analysis. Um, I've been doing analyses of undervoting rates, you know, Senate versus president and um, president votes versus the number of total ballots cast. And I've seen a few counties that look odd. Oneida County stands out. And I've got to call them Monday. But they, it, it, that's one of those things that looks so odd. It's either a, it, it wouldn't be a hack. It's, you know, more, more votes for president than there were ballots cast. Uh, not more votes for president than the registered voters, but more votes than ballot cast. I've got to call those counties and just ask on Monday, you know, what's going on if they know. You um, know, some anomalies are such that no hacker would ever create them. How much of that could be due to same-day registration, which is a phenomenon in Wisconsin? Um, I, yeah, I to tell you the truth, I haven't been doing analyses against registered voters because I know that those data just aren't there yet. Uh, the municipal clerks handle registration and they don't have to report regis new registered voters to the state for 45 days or something. Yikes. I've been doing analyses of the number of ballots they said were cast on election day and the number of votes for president. Now in every county that should be about 96, 97% the, of the voters who cast ballots should have cast, voted for president. You normally expect that. Um, but in only Oneida County did I see an outliner where they said they had 106% votes for president. They, they had more votes for president than they had ballots. They had more votes for possible. president than ballots, not just registered voters, but ballots. That's right. smoke. <laughs> I mean, those, those numbers should be firm and good, yes. not registered voters yet. Yes. Um... Why did you run for county clerk, Dean? I mean, are you nuts? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, because, well, okay. No, I'm not nuts. I, in, in Wisconsin, the county clerk is, is the only public official that can make sure election results are correct. Yeah. The state elections board in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Elections Commission now, and the GAB before, had really remarkably little authority over how well the elections were run. This is a very decentralized state, and the county clerk in Wisconsin has the kinds of responsibilities that secretaries of state have in other states. And it was doable. I mean, if we get one county clerk in Wisconsin, just one, who's willing to say, look, this can be done. We can verify accuracy during the county canvas and I'm gonna do it. You know, we could demonstrate it beautifully. There's so much in Wisconsin that really is good. Precinct level counts and um, digital ballot images and a paper record of every ballot. And, you know, I could go on. There's lots good about Wisconsin. If we just had a county clerk that was willing, number one, you know, to enforce and follow every rule that's on the book and number two, to do rigorous post-election auditings, we could be a shining national model of what verified, accurate, transparent elections look like. And I wanted to be able to do that because the Dane County clerk right now is just not interested. Okay. Are you familiar with Virginia Martin in Columbia County, New York? Oh, yes, yes. How yes. would, have you seen how she does, does the count, which in, in summary is, they bring all the ballots back to the central county and they recount all of the 
close elections. And what a close election is, I'm not sure, but they recount all of the close elections. How does that compare and contrast where you were talking about risk limiting audits and some things like that? And the interesting thing is you said that, that doing that cost a one percent of their budget. Um it's, you comment on that. Yeah. Uh, you could be doing decent audits for a very low fee, very low cost. Um yeah, I, um, it wouldn't be just stepping in and doing a full recount of every race, no matter what. That's, that You probably couldn't do that during the county canvas. Um, and as county clerk, I'd push to get the <laughs> time limit a little extended. But, um, yeah, it, it, if I'd been elected county clerk, the first thing I would have done was call together a citizens advisory commission and experts advisory commission and really put together some good policies and procedures for how to select which races to be audited when. There, there's a certain amount of things you have to do during the county canvas before you certify results as accurate. Like risk limiting auditing doesn't verify that Jim Smith got 34,935 votes. It verifies Jim Smith got more votes than anyone else. And that's really all you need to do during the county canvas. Then after you've certified results, then you could go back and do more detailed full hand counts and check the individual machines were working right and that sort of stuff. But you'd want to put together those kind of procedures that Virginia Martin has, you know, um, put together over the years. Uh, yeah, to run efficient, um, transparent audits. And audits have to be efficient, not just for the sake of the county staff, but for sake of citizen observers, if it's going to be transparent, citizens have to be there to observe. And if you're going to spend, you know, eight hours a day during the working hours counting votes in a way that they can't see or, you know, stay the whole time, then it's not transparent. You have to have something that goes quick and is observable. Plus, one of the things we're keeping in mind here in California, first of all, uh, by the way, the Secretary of State does not have much day-to-day -day control over elections. Uh, it's going to be similar to Wisconsin. But uh, we're talking about 58 county chaos because similar to Wisconsin, the counties run the show. And I can go 10 miles here and cross the county border and it's going to be done very differently. And we need to, to establish statewide regulations and ultimately some national patterns so that observers can come in and, and, and people can come in from California, Colorado, into Wisconsin and have an idea of what's going on and how things are done. I, I think that you go from Dane County to Brown County and it's going to be different. And that's just too chaotic. Jimmy Carter will not observe elections in the United States because it's too cha chaotic. Um, I kind of agree with that problem statement, but um, before I was before I retired and got into election integrity, my career was in state government, specifically 17 years with something called the Legislative Audit Bureau, which is the um, state equivalent of the GAO at the federal level. Okay. And basically, I spent 17 years ar going around the state troubleshooting in different public programs about what's going wrong. You can write all the regulations you want, and if you don't have good oversight and monitoring and feedback to the local officials who are supposed to be following those regulations, those regulations don't mean anything. If I had to put my finger on one thing right now, at least in Wisconsin, it's oversight and implementation of the regulations we have that's the problem. It's not bad regulations. Okay. And, um, and that's always going to be a challenge. How do you... How do you monitor the implementation of voting machine security requirements, for example, when the voting machines are stored in 1,851 municipalities around Wisconsin? That's a problem. And, and there was, I guess, back in the Walker recall days, at uh, one point, a company offered a whole bunch of voting machines to a lot of counties at the same time. Could you tell us that story just briefly? <laughs> uh, that was before I was involved with election integrity, and uh, yeah, that there was a big uh, explosion of um, DRE machines, especially in western Wisconsin. They had some salesman there that was just really successful in getting them to adopt the DRE machines. Um, last I checked, the use of DRE machines in Wisconsin is is going down now again, though. The, um, 
And uh, when you say DRE, you mean paperless? No, paperless machines have not never been legal in Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, there's touch screens with paper trails and op scans in Wisconsin. Okay. And, and there, a few jurisdictions hand count too. Um, it's something I haven't been following closely, but I did hear some of the northern counties had, you know, old, outdated touch screens, and the county or the municipalities were debating whether they should, and the machines were getting old, and the question was, how should we replace them? And they said, it's too expensive to replace them, let's just hand count. I need to, I need to get myself updated on that. I think some jurisdictions might be going back to hand count just because of the cost, not because of any concern about accuracy. Yeah. <laughs> There's problems with any any way of counting ballots. I, I prefer my, my my mantra is I want machines to check the hand count and hand counts to check the machines. That's something of an I, ideal solution. Maybe we will get there. Uh, uh, maybe a, a that. bit a diff bit of a different question, but for looking down the road, you run for county clerk. We need people to step up and run for county clerk. Uh, do you have any advice or comments to give to them? <laughs> How do you um, do it? What, 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 I mean, you didn't quite succeed, but what should they be aware of? What should they look for? Uh, how do you make that happen? Oh, I, I picked a very uphill battle. I, this Madison, Dane County is, a, is so heavily Democrat. And I was running as an independent because I just think election integrity, elections have to be nonpartisan administered. But and he was an incumbent and he's pretty popular. He's he's a he's a nice guy. He's a really good politician, even if he's a bad county clerk. But um, number one, I run a, run when the seat's open. <laughs> Don't run against an incumbent. That's a good idea. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have all, I've learned all sorts of things about campaigning, but I don't want to go into all of those here and now. Um, if anyone wants to contact me, if they're thinking of running for county clerk, I'd be, I'll share with my lessons learned. But um, in general, if you can get yourself involved in a local countywide campaign before you run, just to learn how it's done, do that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm seeing somebody said that the recount manual is at http colon slash slash elections dot wi dot gov slash manual slash recount that's up on the ballots for bernie page with the with the live stream so you can check that out um anything else that you want to say for people Coming from to Wisconsin, I was born and raised in Wisconsin. I think they will buy, find the Your people. audio is, I'm, I'm not hearing you again if you're talking. Anything else you want to say to people coming from Wisconsin about uh, observing this count and trying to afterwards, down the road, you make sure that we can use this recount to promote election integrity across the country i if you just asked me a question i didn't hear it all okay your, your one. voice was cutting out one again anything you any other tips or ideas you have for people coming to wisconsin to observe um no, I I guess not nothing that's not standard advice. Uh, number one, don't walk in assuming the county clerk is crooked. Most of them aren't. Most of them are just innocent people trying to do the best they can. And if their machines were hacked, they don't know anything about it. Um, that's good advice right there for starters. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, what would you like to see? We're going to have the recount. It's going to be chaos and messy for the next couple of weeks. And there's going to be, unfortunately, a lot of mud being thrown back and forth. People on the right are saying Soros is behind all of this, which is nonsense. Um, I don't know that Soros isn't making some contribution, but he's not running this show. No. What would you like to see be the outcome of this recount a year from now? Boy, 
Why didn't I think of these questions ahead of time? Um, I would like to see a lot more people involved on an ongoing basis with election integrity. I would like to see a lot of people in Wisconsin understanding the value of ongoing attention to elections. Um, there's plenty of things you can observe, not just recounts. There's pre-election voting machine tests uh, that are very fun and easy to observe and very educational. And and we've had miscounts in Wisconsin because citizens weren't at these pre-election voting machine tests uh, where they could have been caught and weren't. Um, People can observe, observe municipal canvases. And, you know, no canvas meeting should ever happen without citizen observers there. And it's the exception that observers are there. You know, I just, I would just love to get much more ongoing attention to elections administration, people just really getting to know their municipal clerks, getting to know their county clerks, being involved in good times and bad uh, to help oversee that things are done right. Okay. Um... We see one of the people has posted that you can volunteer in Wisconsin by going to www.jill2016.com slash recount WI. Uh, there you can also do then recount slash recount MI for Michigan slash recount PA for Pennsylvania. There's some slight chance that they can extend the recount to some other states, but we still need donations. They've started to slow down. They have a $7 million goal. And go to jill2016.com and please make a donation so we hit the $7 million mark. If we pass that, we can go on to consider other states or at least um, the leaders have clearly stated that any money left over is going to be put back into not Jill Stein's Green Party, but for election integrity activities. And this is, I trust these people. I know them. Karen knows them. Uh, Ballots for Bernie, along with the Voting Rights Task Force, just held a conference in October where these leaders met here in, in California. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet them and numerous other people whose names are coming up. Uh, please, right now, fund the Jill Stein recount effort because this is an opportunity that doesn't come along very often. I mean, we didn't have much of a re recount in the past two elections. Now it's happening. Now we need to get in there and find out and show that everything's not just right. Uh, so go to Recount Wisconsin to volunteer. I think that if for those of you who can afford it, or if you are in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, do it. You will or learn a lot. if you have lot. friends in Wisconsin, call them up and encourage them to volunteer. Yeah, call your friends and, and, and your, um, your uncle that loves Donald Trump and say that even Donald Trump was talking about checking the election. Candidate Trump was saying, we need to check the elections. The elections are rigged. Yeah, okay, please, let's check the election. Everybody get into this. And because this is a nonpartisan issue, Trump was saying the election is rigged, that um, he was right. And if he had been pushing for a recount, I would be supporting that too. This may be a technicality. Oh. Uh, I don't think the Stein campaign would like having Trump supporters volunteer to observe for the Stein well, campaign. That, that may be you, true, but they can still go to the county. If you people who supported Trump, have him call the Trump campaign because they could use observers too. They should be pushing, the, the Trump people should be pushing Donald Trump to uh, to help with the recount. And I'm seeing questions of, well, why aren't they recounting in certain states that Donald Trump narrowly won? Well, uh, Mr. Trump can pay for it. And he can get his people there, and I will support that. And a lot of us would support that because we want everything checked everywhere. We can't get that right now. So we're going to do three states, but go look, go observe, uh, and stay involved. Do you have any final words, Karen McKim? Um, no, your questions were pretty thorough. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. And as a final word, this these live streams are, are done by Balance for Bernie, which is a fabulous group that is 
in California and expanding. Uh, we are, this is our first remote, uh, remote video interview. Thank you, Karen, for being the pioneer on that. Uh, we need to try to upgrade the technology so we can do this a little bit more professionally. And so I want to encourage people also to go to GoFundMe.com slash Take Back the Vote to support Ballots for Bernie's efforts to, uh, one, continue these live stream interviews, two, we're going to be active in the coming year on changing California legislation and federal legislation, and this takes money. We may even, if we have the money, hold another conference next year. This one, well, you had in October, uh, was really good. It far surpassed, I think, most everybody's expectations, and we want to try to do that next year. So please, first fund the recount, but then if you have a little bit extra, go to GoFundMe.com slash Take Back the Vote and give us a few few dollars to help our efforts to bring the election integrity message out to the United States. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. And thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next week.